Hello, this is part of the controlled environment plant production engineering slash technology education modules that were developed and presented by the Ohio State University, Rutgers University, and the University of Arizona with support from the USDA NEFA program. This module deals with greenhouse location and structures and is presented to you by AJ Both at Rutgers University and Jean Giacomelli at the University of Arizona. The learning objective of this module is that by the end, you should be able to identify the different styles of greenhouse structures in use around the world. Additional resources that might be useful are the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineering practice uh, standards, engineering practice 640 and as well as uh, 406 perhaps, and the book Greenhouse Engineering by Aldrich and Bartok. Before you start thinking about a greenhouse structure, you need to go through lots of thinking and preparing yourself uh, and some of the issues that you need to deal with and need to resolve are listed on this slide. First of all, you need to work on a business plan because very likely you will need to uh, get funding for your project and one of the first things that any funder will will ask for is what is your business plan so a business plan is really critical in the process before you start thinking about construction you need to have an idea of how, how about how you're going to finance your your construction so again uh, who is going to provide the money uh, what kind of interest rates are you going to have to pay etc etc marketing of the product that you produce is really, really critical. Because if you, if you grow a, a very good crop, but you can't sell it, uh, you're not gonna make a profit and you're not gonna be in business very long. So you need to think about the different crop varieties, the different types of growing systems you need for them. You need to think about scheduling, especially when you're growing crops for special holidays like Mother's Day or Valentine's Day. You need to figure out what your clientele is, who are you going to sell this product to, and how are you going to approach that clientele, how are you going to make them aware of your product, and how are you going to uh, make them interested in your product. Labor is very critical. The greenhouse business typically uh, requires extra labor during periods of time when you're sowing or when you're harvesting, and so you need to make sure you have a plan for how you're going to uh, staff all the positions that are needed to run your business smoothly. You need to worry about local laws and regulations. Uh, they can vary from state to state or from county to county. You need to, of course, uh, worry about uh, federal regulations. You, you need to have a full understanding of what impacts your business and what kind of practices you need to follow in order to stay within the law and follow all the regulations. You need to have plans for contingencies. What, do you, what are you going to do when there is a utility failure, when the power fall, is, is out for an extended period of time? What kind of pest and disease management strategies are you going to follow um, when you do get pests and diseases in your operation? You also may want to think about future expansion. Um, many businesses start small and once they get successful, they, they want to expand. And if you have already thought about expansion and worked it into your plan, it becomes much easier and also less expensive uh, to expand. And there may be lots of other reasons because of your local situation and your personal circumstances that you need to worry about. So before you even think about construction, you need to go through a, a long thought process. You need to address all these issues that I've indicated here uh, to make sure that you start off on the right foot. As in real estate, uh, greenhouse siting is all about location, location, location. You need to think, for example, about access roads. How do you get product to your facility and how do you ship your, your uh, plants or your products uh, to your ultimate buyers? You need to have utilities on site, uh, gas, electric, uh, water. Uh, and if they're not on site, you need to bring them to your site. And if it's far away, that can be very expensive. You need to worry about permits, local permits, regional permits. Um, you need to think about planning. You need to think about 
how your construction is going to uh, take place and which different trades are going to be part of the construction process and how can these different trades like plumbers and, and welders and, and, uh, and such, how can they work together to make sure that the whole construction process runs smoothly. So a lot goes into this whole process. So let's look at some of the different greenhouse designs that we can find if we look at greenhouse production systems around the world. The first one that I want to mention, and perhaps uh, not very well known in, in North America, but certainly well known in China, and, and this is probably the, the system that is most widely used around the world, is the so-called Chinese solar greenhouse. It's a relatively simple structure that uses no additional heating, is typically oriented south with a very thick and heavily insulated north-facing wall, and the idea is that during this, the daytime, uh, light can freely penetrate into the structure and the light also heats the, the, the heavily insulated north-facing wall um, so that that absorbs a lot of heat during the daytime. And at night, when the greenhouse cover is uh, insulated by unrolling uh, blankets or um, biomass uh, like straw materials, are placed over it, um, that, that heat that was stored in the, in the thick wall is slowly released and is able to maintain adequate temperatures during the nighttime period without having additional heating in the greenhouse. So we would typically consider this a, a relatively low-tech approach, but it can be highly effective for growing uh, with minimal energy inputs. In, in North America and in Europe, we have seen a significant increase in interest in the so-called high tunnel. So here you see an example of a small high tunnel uh, used for growing vegetables. These are very simple structures, typically a single layer of uh, polyethylene film. Uh, we use roll-up sides for ventilation, and we also don't use any additional heating uh, in these structures. We do need, of course, as in the Chinese solar greenhouse, we do need a source of water to irrigate the crop. But other than that, it's basically a, a, a shelter that allows us to start production a little easy, earlier in the growing season and extend the, the growing season a little bit later compared to field production. And those extensions allow us to, to make a little bit more money uh, in a system like this compared to a, um, and a field production system. And as you can see, we can, we can use these kind of systems for, for year-round production as well. Here you see an example of a, a snow-covered high tunnel in Pennsylvania uh, with a crop inside. So if you manage these systems well, despite cold conditions, uh, and of course using crops that are, are able to survive in colder conditions, uh, you can use these structures year-round without having any supplemental heating. We can also use gutter connected versions of these high tunnels. Here you see an example of gutter connected tunnels used for an asparagus production in the Netherlands. Um, and we can use them for a variety of crops, uh, but of course we are trying to uh, reduce the amount of structure and the amount of surface area needed to cover uh, our growing area. By adding uh, or by using gutter connected systems, we reduce the surface area and it, it makes it cheaper and also easier to maintain conditions underneath. Another uh, typical form of greenhouses are hoop houses. Uh, they, are, they come in different designs. Some have rounded arched uh, roofs. Some have more peaked or gothic uh, designs. The, the rounded roofs are uh, somewhat problematic in areas where you have uh, a large snow load because it's not so easy to get the snow off, particularly the, the flatter part of the roof. And hence, in those uh, areas, we typically build more gothic-shaped or arch-shaped uh, structures that allow the snow to slide off a little easier. Um, but these, again, are, are relatively inexpensive structures, typically covered with double film that we inflate. We do the inflation to add a still layer of air that creates a an insulating blanket, so we reduce the heat loss uh, when we do that. And depending on the sophistication, some of these hoop houses have heating systems, have ventilation systems, and are, uh, are 
somewhat of a step up compared to the high tunnel systems in the Chinese solar greenhouses I showed you earlier. An example of a gutter connected greenhouse, again we, we, we do that compared to the uh, hoop style, the, the, the freestanding greenhouse to try to reduce the total surface area. So in this case it's, it's a heated greenhouse with a ventilation system. We reduce the, s the unit surface area per unit uh, growing space, floor space, and thus we reduce the heat loss per unit growing space and thus we save energy compared to freestanding houses. Although freestanding houses can be individually controlled, so sometimes it, it makes sense to have freestanding houses when you grow larger batches of plants that all maintain similar uh, or require similar conditions then these gutter connected houses can be very effective. We can also uh, use uh, these houses for natural ventilation systems. Here you see a gutter connected house where we don't have mechanical ventilation with, with fans we have uh, windows that open up and the windows are placed strategically in the side wall and in the ridges of the roofs to allow for air to move through. And if you do this carefully, this design, and you place the greenhouse perpendicular to prevailing wind directions, you can still uh, generate sufficient ventilation during most parts of the year. During the summertime, uh, when air conditions are, are warm and, and air doesn't move very much, it becomes more problematic. But during most periods of the time, especially when you are in a more windy location, uh, this system works very well to vent the greenhouse. We can also um, use Venlo style greenhouses. These are typically also naturally ventilated. They have only windows in the roof, so no side windows. Uh, and they typically rely on uh, their height, the, so the, the, the stack effect or the chimney effect generates air to rise to the peak to exit the greenhouse, but more, they, more so they rely on the wind effect where wind pressures generated by airflow around the greenhouse and over the greenhouse uh, generate pressure differences that then help move air through the greenhouse structure. So again, if the outside conditions are not too warm and you have sufficient wind conditions around the greenhouse, these systems are very useful uh, for uh, ventilating uh, greenhouses without having to rely on mechanical fans that require electricity to operate and thus increase the energy use of a greenhouse facility. Here's an example of a wide span greenhouse. Uh, Depending on the crop you're growing, uh, it can be advantageous to have a, a larger span greenhouse. Typically that means you go, uh, you go up quite high for the peak height, uh, so there's a lot of air volume in a structure like this. Uh, but as you can see in this image, it also creates a very large growing area uh, that may be advantageous for the particular crop that you're trying to grow. An example of what I would call extreme natural ventilation are these open roof greenhouses, a relatively new design where the entire roof opens up f allowing for ventilation. Um, this creates temperatures inside the greenhouse that are virtually identical to outside conditions uh, almost year round once the windows are opened or once the roof are opened. Um, and this is not possible typical, typically with naturally ventilated, uh, otherwise naturally ventilated or mechanically ventilated greenhouses. You need to move a lot of air in those systems to have temperatures inside the greenhouse that are the same as the outside temperatures. But with this open roof design, you are able to maintain temperatures inside that are virtually the same as the temperatures outside. One of the drawbacks of this system is that the vertical roof segments generate shading patterns on the floor, especially when you think about uh, a design that hinges at the gutter, so you have two roof sections next to each other, so sunlight coming in at an angle has to travel through two roof sections before it enters the greenhouse environment. And uh, depending on the, sh the, the width of the shadow bands and the duration of the shadow bands in a particular location, that could be an issue. So the, the placement of the greenhouse, the orientation of the greenhouse relative to the 
the, the path that the sun is traveling through the atmosphere uh, can be important if you are concerned about shadow bands in the greenhouse and the duration of those shadow bands in specific locations. Another open type structure is a retractable roof design that you see in this image. Uh, it's a cloth-like material that is retracted most of the time except during uh, cold weather or heavy precipitation events it can be closed and protect the crop underneath. So here you see uh, a system like this used at a nursery where the plants are most of the time perfectly happy being exposed to the outside environment but under some extremer conditions like heavy precipitation or, or colder temperatures uh, this structure is used to protect the plants and, and have them survive throughout the winter period. An example of a typical plug production greenhouse where plugs are grown on benches. The benches are designed so that they fill almost the entire greenhouse area, so the space utilization efficiency is very high. Uh, and again, you can see here, this is a gutter-connected Venlo-style greenhouse uh, with sufficient height that allows for uh, overhead heating pipes as well as uh, a supplemental lighting system uh, without really interfering with, the, with the, uh, the proper production system for this crop. Some growers that grow bedding plants in the springtime like to have the opportunity to bring the plants to the outside during the days where the conditions favor, uh, favor that process, so sunny conditions that, where the temperatures are not too cold. And so what they typically do, they grow plants in two layers, one directly on the floor and one on these benches that can then be rolled out to the outside. So in fact, you're doubling the production capacity of your greenhouse space. The challenge, of course, is what do you do during darker days or colder days when, it's not, when you're not possible to bring the plant material on the top layer to the outside. The main reason for bringing these plants to the outside is that they harden off, they get exposed to outside conditions like solar radiation and, and extra wind conditions, and that makes their survival rate uh, once they end up with the consumer a little bit higher. So bedding plant producers are, are typically uh, keen on hardening this plant material off because it makes the survival rate higher once the consumer gets, uh, gets the plant material uh, at home and is ready to plant them in their garden. We also grow lots of vegetables. Here you see an example of a tomato greenhouse, a very typical tomato greenhouse system, the high wire system where plants are supported from wires uh, in a large range in, in Japan. But it could be anywhere around the world. This is a very common system. Uh, a hydroponic tomato greenhouse in Belgium is the next slide here. Uh, you see different Varieties are grown in this system uh, where, and the plants are grown in, in uh, troughs in the nutrient film technique system. So the troughs are slightly sloped. Water and nutrients are distributed at the high end and then by gravity water flows by the roots to the low end of the trough and is collected and reused for the next irrigation cycle. If you look at this greenhouse carefully you see it's basically a wall-to-wall -wall operation, so the space utilization efficiency is very, very high. Um, plants are put in at the far end and uh, their growth rate coincides with the movement of the plants from the far end to the near end. Uh, and this is all done with a mechanical system that moves each of those troughs from the far end to the near end. And then if you time the, the growth rate with the movement correctly, then you can put your young seedlings in the greenhouse at the far end and you can harvest the mature plants at the near end. And this is exactly what this greenhouse operation is doing. We also use floating systems to grow a variety of crops, typically crops that are not too heavy and not too tall. So lettuces and other greens, including basil, as you see in this picture. The advantage again is that you can move plant material very easily. Uh, you can put it in at one end of the greenhouse on these floaters and you can then push it easily through to the other end of the greenhouse and if you time the motion of movement again with the growth rate of the plants then you can uh, put them in, in a, at a small size in one end and 
harvest the mature plants at the other end uh, throughout your system. So it becomes a very easy way of moving plants and a very efficient way of, of uh, uh, dealing with, with your plant material while maintaining a very high, uh, very high space efficiency uh, in your greenhouse operation. Another system that some growers are using are, is aeroponics, where we spray water and nutrients directly to the roots. You see here a system that is partially opened to have, to have you have a look inside. So typically uh, a cavity uh, with spray nozzles is, is uh, designed and installed. And then plants are uh, inserted in the canopy that covers that space. The roots are inside and are kept in the dark and are then sprayed periodically with water and nutrients so that the plants can, can grow and, and, and mature. Another growing system that some growers use is an aeroponic system. This is a system that sprays water and nutrients uh, onto the roots periodically. The roots are placed in a dark cavity um, and so the plants are then able to pick up nutrients and water as needed and uh, the leaf and the stems are located outside uh, that cavity. This is an orchid greenhouse in Japan. Uh, orchids are grown uh, under low light conditions and so there, there are special uh, provisions made in this greenhouse to provide uh, low light conditions and grow. Orchids also like uh, highly controlled temperatures so there are, there are uh, air conditioning units installed in this greenhouse as well uh, to make sure optimum plant conditions are maintained at all time. Another example from Japan is this uh, vertical system that grows strawberries in two layers. Uh, I wanted to show you this example because it, it gives you an, an idea of how a, this particular grower manages growing in two layers. The, the bottom layer could be uh, tipped and then moved to the top layer and so plants were continuously rotated from the top layer to the bottom layer so that each of the plants were getting equal amounts of light ensuring equal uh, growth rates for both the plants on the top layer as well as the bottom layer. Another example of strawberries this, in this case in, in Belgium where the troughs are raised to make uh, it easier for people that have to walk between the plants and pick the berries. Um, and as well as in this case, the, the, the plants are uh, receiving photoperiod lighting to induce the flowering and thus the berry production using LED uh, lamps specifically designed for this purpose. In some cases, we grow uh, specialty crops in greenhouse environments because uh, there's a special market for it or because the price is is right. Here you see an example of cherries being produced in a greenhouse in Belgium. Other examples are, for example, raspberries uh, in greenhouse structures. Some greenhouses are designed for very special purposes. Here you see an example of a demonstration greenhouse in the Netherlands where they demonstrated the movement of tables uh, to a central irrigation uh, station. So each of these tables uh, was entered into a computer system and then depending on environmental conditions, particularly solar radiation and temperature, the computer decided when it was time for each of these tables to be irrigated and then moved the table to a, a fixed irrigation station where water and nutrients were applied to each individual bench after which the bench was then moved again back into the greenhouse environment. So a highly automated system. In some cases, we see very special greenhouse design. Here you see this sawtooth design in Arizona, where we like this particular design for warmer climates, uh, where we can use prevailing wind directions to improve the, the ventilation of these structures. So if the prevailing wind direction in this case is coming from our left and blowing to the right, um, you can see that the air has to go over the greenhouse roof and just as it detaches from the peak, it creates this area of low pressure, uh, of turbulence that helps suck out the warmer air inside the greenhouse. So by designing this particular roof structure, we can improve the ventilation in this house 
and hopefully provide better growing conditions for the plants. In some warm climates, like here in India, uh, you can see that uh, the greenhouse is mostly a screen house where uh, inlet openings and outlet openings are heavily screened uh, and otherwise the, the, the greenhouse is more or less exposed to environmental conditions. Not a lot of heating or other uh, environmental control practices are being used, uh, but the screens are obviously important to try to maintain uh, insect-free conditions inside the growing environment. Another shade house is uh, shown here in Florida where the sides are completely opened but the roof uh, or the shade screen material is only placed on top of the plant growing area. This is done for two purposes. It helps to reduce uh, soil radiation directly on top of the crop and it can also help with heavy precipitation, hail and, and heavy rainfall uh, preventing any damage from the crop under those conditions. Another different type of greenhouses are greenhouses designed as conservatories and here you see an example of the U.S. Botanic Garden in D.C. And then we have uh, highly specialized greenhouses like the Biosphere 2 in Arizona that was designed to maintain different ecosystems to try to simulate um, the biosphere as we know it on Earth. So they have areas in this greenhouse facility that mimic uh, tropical environments or more temperate environments, uh, or in this case an ocean environments as you show in this picture, to try to simulate the interaction of, the, of all these different environments uh, as it is occurring uh, in, on our planet. We also see a lot of interest uh, recently in rooftop greenhouses, particularly greenhouses located in densely populated areas, so as, ma as major cities. So here you see an, an example of a greenhouse installed in Canada uh, on top of a building. Another growing system that has received a lot of attention recently is the vertical farming system, where we are trying to grow plants in major uh, city areas, in, in, heavy, in areas with high population density. The idea is that we can uh, reduce the shipping distance uh, and we can grow plants at very high uh, densities. Uh, so the footprint of a growing system like this is relatively small. We would grow plants in apartment-like buildings uh, at different levels. Um, and the debate has been about whether this is a good idea or not. I have my reservations about this idea, but nevertheless, many people are interested about this and are actively pursuing uh, demonstration projects and uh, installations to demonstrate that this is indeed a, a viable option for uh, resolving some of the issues of um, uh, limited accessibility in, in major cities to uh, food products and, and plant products, and also uh, reduce the, the land use required for growing our food. Uh, so we'll see in the future uh, where this is all going. We'd like to acknowledge the funding that was received for this effort by the USDA NEFA program.